Hello and welcome to Skeleton Songs. Skeleton Songs. We've been away for a bit um, because we moved house um, and we were busy contemplating the infinite, reading more Gothic stuff. Taking things out of boxes after we put all the things in boxes. Very spooky boxes. Spooky boxes. But a spooky books. We're talking about madness and blood, aren't we? We are, and I have a feeling that this is going to be an episode <laughs> where you... Um, pick out lots of interesting anecdotes because I believe it's quite specifically to do with the gothic fear of women and madness and blood. I mean, we're we're going to be honest here. The fear of um, that men feel towards women in in the gothic context and beyond. There's a lot of mythology here. But when I started looking into madness and blood, I found that that there's a particular kind of blood that comes up very often, especially with a lot of. Um, Mythology has been written by by men, and as you and literature, as you'll be aware, if you don't, almost all gothic literature has to do with menstruation. No, it's been written by men. Ugh. Oh yeah, well. you see, it begins already. <laughs> the baiting. I'm sorry, I erased you. No, I'm just going to start. Uh, I'm, I'm going to start by mentioning in passing the Red Grail, uh, the cult of Simulator <laughs> Hour. And again, uh, to be clear for for listeners who are not aware of this, the Red Grail is one of the many. Uh, are they gods? Or are secret they d- gods. Secret ish. gods in our, our video game Culture Simulator. And the Red Grail is by far and away probably the most disgusting. I mean, I don't think that's the case. I think you're basing this on one yes, particular and you know the scene. One. I do know the one. Uh, so There's it, a particular scene in the depths of the wood at a certain time of the month. And I'll just leave that there. So it's, a, it's the well in the wood. Oh, we, we're not leaving which it is, there. Which is Ladies Palpan. and gentlemen, we are describing it in detail. Well, we're not describing it in detail. Because I described it in detail to you at the time. And I, I, I wrote the description mm-hmm. and I came to you and I said... Mm, you did. As a woman who menstruates... Mm, it's always a good start to a, to a date night, isn't When it? you read this description, does it make you think about menstruation? And you mm. said it did. So I think I did my job there. Mm. Mm. Menstru- I can't say as a woman, that <laughs> menstruation remains really gross. Well, funny you should mention that, because oh, here God. is Pliny the Elder in his natural history talking about menstruation. I'd love to hear what Pliny the Elder has to say about menstruation. But nothing could easily be found that is more remarkable than the monthly flux of women. Contact with it turns new wine sour, <laughs> crops touched by it become barren, grafts die, seeds in gardens are dried up. The fruit of trees falls off. The bright surface of mirrors in which it is merely reflected is dimmed. The edge of steel and the gleam of ivory are dulled. Hives of bees die. Even bronze and iron are at once seized by rust. And a horrible smell fills the air. To taste it drives dogs mad. I'm sorry. And infects their bites with an incurable poison. So, okay, just to, the mental image that we all have here is Pliny the Elder smearing, <laughs> smearing menstrual blood over everything in a sort of pseudo-scientific spirit of investigation and finding that it smells bad, it makes everything less nice than before he smeared the menstrual blood on things, and dogs aren't a fan of it. Is that, is that what we've learned from this extract? I think basically the way it works is a guy told Pliny, <laughs> a guy who met a woman. <laughs> I'm not sure any women were involved in this at all, actually, but... But sure, but, but the thi- I think I mean, you should stick to volcanoes, is all I'm saying. <laughs> so I, I think, seriously, menstruation is a pretty good shorthand for one of the ways in which men are frightened of women. I mean, one of the ways, one of the other ways in which men are frightened of women is, is that... Oh, just to be clear, according to literature. According to literature. This isn't like some sort of David yes, Icke yes. reveal. <laughs> <laughs> so the trope is that men <laughs> spend you. a lot of time wanting to have sex with women. They do. Um, they do. And... Uh, and that's all great but sometimes women turn around and want to have sex with them and that could be a little bit alarming <laughs> uh, and that's basically where I think where a lot of vampire stories come from because women are actually out looking for sex which you know if you're a, especially a slightly sort of um, introverted writer you don't necessarily know how to uh, to deal with you see I think that's a very sympathetic reading of, of, of that well because funnily it's, enough it's I've chosen to be sympathetic basically nonsense isn't it I mean, what you were just talking about goes back to a literary trope um, that I was talking to you about earlier, the the Madonna Hall complex. Mm. Um, And this actually has its origins in Freudian psychoanalysis, which we can safely deposit in the waste paper bin for being total nonsense. Um, You're just going to write off all of Freud. I am, actually, I am. I think he is a fascinating individual who had a lot of fun ideas. And And cocaine. (laughs) Did he have cocaine? He was big into cocaine. That explains so much. He, he, he went through this phase where he thought it was really great and he used to like put bowls of it on the sideboard at parties. I mean, to be fair, 
Uh, is that or know, the menstrual blood? Pharmacology was the in parties in were better when he swapped realize. it out. And it, eventually he, he got addicted and I think he, he actually suffered health problems in his face because of it so well, much. Well, look, I'm very sorry he that recanted, he, he, but... he drugged himself into an early grave, but he, he had some issues with, with ladies, I'll put it like that. And I do like him because um, he psychoanalytic literary theory is really fun. It's a really enjoyable activity to partake in so the classic example of this um if you haven't ever read a book with psychoanalytic theory in mind is um henry james's the turn of the screw which i'm not going to go into it's a slightly different topic we'll probably discuss it in detail on a later podcast but um a lot of uh the analysis of that story is about whether or not the uh, unnamed narrator who is a woman has repressed sexual desire which results in her doing a number of things or whether she's actually mad or whether she's totally innocent and is telling you exactly what happened and, and it's just these sort of um, circumstance conspires against her so so for that i doff my hat to freud but the rest of him is nonsense and going back to the madonna hall complex for which he is partly responsible is this fundamental idea uh, fundamentally male idea that there are basically two categories of women one of which is this idealized um saintly figure usually associated with both religion and your own mother um, and the idea is that you respect these women but you have no sexual attraction to them because they're too busy being good and, and, and holy um, and of course men do have sexual attraction to women a lot of them um, and that means that that there must be another type of women for, for men to um, direct their sexual attraction to and those women cannot be respected because sex I think is fundamentally not respected in some way and those women therefore become this trope of, of the whore so the idea is that in a lot of literature and I have to say Dickens is a big guilty party in this there's basically the good woman and the bad woman I think I mean yeah also and again, sorry to be clear uh, based in literary tropes not actually any reality or misogynistic theories are right. It's 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 projection, right? Because if you're a man, you know you have feelings, and sometimes these feelings. I mean, obviously, women have feelings too. But um, I'm it's t- not apparent. I'm told. Uh, but but <laughs> we if just you faint a lot, and if, then we it, put if, our blood on knives, and then they rust. If a woman doesn't have sex with you, yeah, then that's bad. But if a woman does have sex with you, that's also bad. Well, that's also bad. Yeah. So that's the problem. That is a problem. But and, and that's what, what one of the nastiest um, Kafka traps. Um, if, if you're a woman living in a um, especially pre-modern, even in modern society, is that if you've put out, uh, then that proves you're not virtuous. Uh, so if you, but if you, if you haven't, then that proves, you know, you're, you're fidgety or, or, or whatever. Because obviously men sometimes have sex and then feel complicated about it mm. afterwards. So it's great if it can be somebody else's fault. That's why I've, I've always really hated, particularly the um, neoclassical chivalrous trope of have pity on me, madam. There are so many nights who go around and fall madly in love with, you know, this particular lady in the tower or this lady they meet on a Tuesday in the forest. And um, they actually get ill with love. It's this actual idea, which was not, you know, a joke at the time, that, that the, the, the lovely young knight, who's nice in every way, we don't dislike him as, as a reader, um, is, is genuinely sickened for love of this woman who obviously denies him because she's a virtuous, attractive woman. So then you get these constant kind of begging conversations where the knight basically says you have to have sex with me or I will literally die and then you'll be a murderer and all the guilt will be on your head um, and then this woman is in this impossible position of either maintaining her virtuous situation of like she just met this guy just appeared at her house and being like you must have sex immediately <laughs> and she's like wait buddy let's have dinner first or she she does have sex with him and saves him but then she, she loses her her virginity probably and her sense mm. of, of of purity and it's it's, it's not really evaluated which is why it's so fascinating when you get to Renaissance literature. And I think we've, we've talked on a previous podcast about um, The Fairy Queen, which is a big favourite of mine, Edmund Spencer. Um, uh, it's really fascinating to see how real men in the real world, who aren't as silly as some of the tropes of Gothic literature about women would imply, um, are desperately trying to figure out how they feel about Queen Elizabeth, because she was a big stick in the mud. Um, she was queen and obviously people kings and queens were respected because they were in charge and it was mm. that was just what we did and of course there were also ideas that there was some sort of divine intervention and she was queen because of her bloodline and because God had chosen and because she was special but at the same time there was this basic sense that women were rubbish so so people really bent over backwards to, to try and reconcile 
these two things. England was great, but England was ruled by somebody who wasn't great, which meant England wasn't great, but England was great. But women are rubbish, but she's queen. So all these all these uh, contradictory ideas. And in literature, this basically results in this return to neoclassicist ideals. And in the chivalrous mode, this means that women can both be idealised and also um, demeaned. Because on the one hand, women don't do anything in traditional chivalrous romances. They just get rescued or are witches, basically. Um, but also they're this sort of idealised grail figure um, which are quested after and this allowed a lot of literature at the time including things like the fairy queen to basically position mm. elizabeth as somebody who was great and admirable and fantastic i'm so pleased i'm definitely pleased that she's on the throne but also allow men to maintain control in the new world order that that makes a lot of sense and i was um i was surprised to, to hear you being so cross with knights to know how much you love the fairy queen and what that what you've just said makes sense of, of, of that I was thinking um, a, a few years ago when I was doing some contract work for a, a certain large AAA studio, um, I read up a lot on the intelligence uh, networks of the Elizabethan era. And some of the listeners, I'm sure, will know, have a sort of general idea um, about, you know, Walsingham and the School of Night and um, uh, how Marlowe was, was probably involved. <laughs> Uh, because he probably wasn't paid a very large sum of money just to be somebody's tutor uh, <laughs> off in the low country. Oh, he's so great. And um, what I hadn't realised until I read it is that Elizabeth's um, uh, courtiers and um, counsellors were actually quite effective uh, and ruthless um, in their intelligence uh, and counterintelligence operations because England was very isolated at that point. And it's astonishing, and it's a testament to Elizabeth, among others, uh, that she stayed on the throne for mm. decades. Really because unmarried woman, uh, virgin queen, and in a context where the whole idea of a woman ruling a country seems sort of unnatural. <laughs> and she was a Protestant. Her father, mm. remember it was that recent, had literally just... Um, uh, banished the Catholic Church from Britain and decided that he was the head of, of, of the church. Yeah. Uh, and, and she was the heir of that tradition. So Europe is full of very well, cross was, Catholic monarchs. And she was the heir of that tradition through a mother who'd been beheaded for treason. Yes. So her claim was even less sturdy. But, but she's, she's, she's against nature. And I think that's. <laughs> and that's the end of the podcast. <laughs> but I think that's, that's one of the things about uh, our old friend menstruation again. Oh, yeah, we're back. Is here. it is both against nature. But actually, nature, as far as, as I'm sorry, what do you mean by it's against nature? That's a very that's a, quite a masculine view. Well, I, I was going to say, as far as men are concerned. Ah, uh, okay, because, you missed out that quite important well, add-on. You know, I, I was I was going to get to the end of the sentence, but <sighs> anyway. Uh, so the point is, obviously, it's not against nature. That's that's an insane I thing to say. I think it should be. I have several issues I would like to take up with nature about <laughs> the whole system. But when you first come to the whole subject of menstruation as a man, you know, especially if you grew up in the era God. before it was properly discussed in schools, you know, there's just something going on and it happens at sort of irregular intervals. And people don't talk about it that much. It's sort of yerky and women, when they talk about it, are generally not big fans of it. And, and it's all tied to all that stuff that goes on in there that's complicated and, and you know, you don't really... And if, I, I have to say... Um, being present at the birth of a child uh, does does help with, with, with a, a, a certain amount of this um, visceral confusion. Uh, but visceral is the word, really. Uh, uh, the Alex Comfort, who wrote The Joy of Sex in A, a More Innocent Age, said something uh, very resonant, I think, about um, the, the difference between women, men and women thinking about sex. He said that for men, sex occurs in a sort of separate part of themselves, like the state of Florida. You and for women, it's an, an internal thing. And I think it, it ties back into into that. And the, the thing about the Red Grail is, it is... And, and, OK, to be clear, I'm talking about, about the Red Grail, which is based on a gothic exaggeration of some attitudes men to have towards women. And I'm not talking about women. Uh, but the Red Grail is both monstrous and natural. So mm -hmm. it, it's... The, and it's not just about menstruation, to be clear. No, Again. it's not. It's about birth and it's about blood and it's about consumption and it's about the, 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 the Dionysian impulses in yeah. explicit opposition to the Apollonian impulses of the Lantern and the Watchman. Yeah, yeah. And this is why the Grail is down in the wood 
and the um, uh, all, all the lantern powers tend to congregate at the top of the mansus. So you get this explicit um, contrast between the cerebral and the visceral. And, and is that you, fundamentally how you typify the, the difference between the Dionysian and the Apollonian? Apollonian yes, we'll yes. So I, I, as far as I can tell, the the, the, the way in which you talk about Apollonian to Dionysian these days came out of Nietzsche of all people, but obviously initially it Much came maligned, out of... Much maligned, not a Nazi. <laughs> obviously initially it came out of um, uh, traditions that emerged in uh, Greek culture and mythology. Yeah. And I think it, it's always made intuitive sense to me uh, that, that you one set of human impulses is towards um, abstractness and um, uh, thought, and the other is towards concreteness and feeling. And I think if you go you know, too far down the abstractness and thought route, you end up with this, this perfect burning nothing. And if you go too far down the, um, uh, the, the, the solidity route, you end up sort of drowning in a well of blood. I think, that's, I think the perfect burning nothingness is, is the best description of Apollo that I've ever heard because we've talked before, we're big fans of, of the Greek pantheon, as I'm sure many kind of literary nerds are, um, and I have never felt that Apollo was interesting, even though he officially stands for lots of things that I admire and love. And, and you know, there's lots of beautiful things that he's responsible for when you have the Aeolian harp and, and obviously he's wisdom and, and, and music and poetry and, and, and joy and everything good. And the sun, I suppose that's acceptable. Um, but it, but because he is kind of the purest, because he has this sense of, of the kind of intellectual element, I found it very difficult to identify with him as, mm. a, as an entity. And that's the whole reason that the Greek pantheon and any kind of uh, polytheistic religion, I think, really really has that, that attraction because it, it, it fragments a lot of different human experience into realistic individuals that you can identify with. And then they have interesting stories. Whereas when you get to that level of perfection, um, it, it's hard to make them do anything interesting. I mean, a classic in, in literary... Uh, so in literature example of this would be um, Paradise Lost by Milton, which infamously um, was set out to sort of praise God and, and, and how great Christianity was. But of course, what it really achieved was making Satan really interesting and sympathetic. And that really wasn't his intent. You know, he did deliberately write a, an interesting bit of uh, text because he was a brilliant writer, but, but he, he really wasn't trying to make Satan the kind of the star but everyone was much more interested in what he was doing than god because god just kind of was there in the background being perfect and that's really boring from a dramatic point of view um whatever your religious leanings anyway um i think i think you i hadn't thought of it like that before and it occurs to me to step back from the visceral fear of women by men in literature oh yeah, don't worry we'll get back there listeners uh we've not escaped yet there's there, there, there's another uh trope which sidesteps uh madonna hall and crone and that's someone like Athena or Bridget, who are feminine, uh, but who are types of ingenuity mm. and artifice and thought and competence. Mm. And Athena is, I think, uh, cool. uh, yeah, she's much more appealing intuitively somehow than Apollo. She's she's. And I'm not Quite trying to austere. hate Apollo. I love Apollo. No, no, I'm I just know. saying from a human she's, point of view. She's more approachable somehow. And Bridget, who of Bridget, of course, the the um, uh, Celtic figure associated with inspiration and poetry and also smithing is um, one of the two big roots of the forge of days another hour and, and is, is probably the reason i, I can't really remember days. well she's, she's explicitly female yes partly because of bridget who i've always liked as a uh, as a mythological character can i tell a fun viking story about menstruation I mean, do you, you never your need to. Oh, as a lady. <laughs> do you stop saying as a lady? I think I think it's just it's just you know in contrast to the to, to, to Pliny, this is the sort of perfect Pliny. Norse. He's off the Christmas card list, I'm afraid. <laughs> intersection between um, misogyny and slapstick, uh, <laughs> and and w- what it is, I think you know this one. Uh, Thor is off to have get drunk with some giant. Classic uh, Thor. And and on his way, he's trying to cross the river, uh, and mm. and he. Um, he finds the river is flooding uh, and he's struggling to get across it and the danger of being swept away. So he looks upstream mm-hmm. and he sees one of the giant's daughters, mm-hmm. a lady named Yalp, mm-hmm. who's also a giantess, obviously, mm-hmm. genetics being what it is, is standing mm-hmm. over the river with one leg on one bank and one leg on another bank. 
and she is lending her force to the stream. So Thor is I'm trying sorry, to. She's what? She's lending her force to the stream. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you are hearing a man talk about something he knows nothing about. Well, what you're hearing is is a man talk about lending the translation her force of a to man the stream. because it's Story Stillerson. Obviously, I don't speak Old Norse. Being translated by, I think, Crossley Holland or somebody. Um, and it's all phrased quite coyly. Mm-hmm. So, you know, it could I can be... tell you in the original, it would not have been coy. So, in um, uh, uh, it goes on to be called, because Thor is obviously, you know, powerless against this this female force. Yeah. And it's being driven back to the fire bank. And, fire and water. So, he picks up a big rock. Mm, I, know, I know what this, this is horrible. And he, he, uh, uh, I've got the price quote from the translation. Oh, God. He snatched up a great stone out of the river and cast it at her, saying these words. At its source should a river be stemmed. Uh, nor did he miss that at which he threw. Mm-hmm. And then he crosses the river safely. Mm, so just, just to be clear, um, he, he blocks a lady's natural flow with a boulder so he can yep. get on his way to the pub. <laughs> Is that well, specifically well, the story he then, he then goes to, 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 to her father's house. Inexplicably, she and her sister try to murder him. And inexplicably? If I, if I remember correctly, they get under... The you know, in an inexplicable way, they get under the chair... <laughs> That he's sitting in, and they sort of try to smash the chair against the roof of the house. And okay, he... that is badly thought through, but but yeah. I respect their desires. But the other the other Viking thing, when it comes to blood and madness, um, you see, this... I had such a nicer way that this podcast could go. Well, we... this is about poetry, this bit. Okay. And spit. So, uh, as you, uh, uh, the, the reason I'm talking about this is uh, I went down a bit of an etymological rabbit hole, which which regular listeners will know I, I tend to do. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, Kvasir, um was a um, a figure in Norse mythology who was born out of spit and the reason he was born in spit is that the Icea and the Vanir the two two flavours of, of Norse goddery um, finished their big war and they wanted to have a, a peace um, that lasted so they all came and spat in a pot a big vat uh, to seal it um, and then they got all the spit out and they moulded it into a person right. who was Kvasir who because he'd be made of all the god spittle uh, was, was really wise yeah. And that was great. So he went around being wise to everybody. And the two dwarves got jealous of his wisdom. <laughs> so they murdered him. Uh, and then they... Um, it's Baldur all over again. Mixed his, uh, his, his spit-composed body uh-huh. uh, with honey. Right. And blood. Right. And that's where mead came from. You have... I I'm so angry right now. I love The mead, mead of poetry... So every time you drink, you know, you, every time you get the gift of poetry, it's because you've tasted this blood, spit, honey. And the gods wanted to know where Kvasir had gone. And the dwarves said, oh, he's so big-headed and brainy that he just suffocated to death under the side of his own head. And the, the gods are all like, oh, yeah, you know, brainy people. That's, that's what happens. And um, later on, Odin found out about the, um, the mead of poetry that they were keeping... They had kept in a mountain. There's some giants who took it off. And a giantess was keeping it in a mountain. Now, I want you to see, Lottie, if you can distinguish the Freudian subtext and what happens next. Mm-hmm. So there's this giantess in the mountain guarding the mead. Yeah. And so, so just to be clear, um, abstraction here. We've got female presence between man and his desire. Yeah. Okay. I'm and the, the desire involves blood and honey. Okay. And spit. Bloody desire and, and spit. Uh, and poetry. And Probably more about the alcohol. Really. And so Odin goes to a couple of dwarf brothers and he gets them to make him a big drill. Oh, a really God. big drill. Really? A really big drill. And then he, there's some sort of trickery involved that I don't, don't remember the details of. And he gets, he's, he's under an assumed name because Odin. But he gets this big drill. He starts to drill into the mountain, drill all the way into the mountain, all the way in. Takes it ages. Uh-huh. Um, and the dwarf who's with him says, oh, he drills all the way into the mountain. And Odin blows uh-huh. into the um, hole and the, the, the chips come out. So uh-huh. he realises it's not all the way and he's trying to be tricked. So he keeps drilling. Um, and then... Um, uh, he drills all the way through mm-hmm. and he blows in the chips go in so he knows he's done it mm-hmm. um, so he turns himself into something that can get through the hole into the mountain mm-hmm. uh, is it a worm it's a snake it's a big mm-hmm. snake mm-hmm. so he turns into a big snake yep. and he goes through the drill hole into the mountain the mm-hmm. dwarf tries to stab him with the drill as he goes in but he mm-hmm. misses and he goes in mm-hmm. and he drinks the but first and you'll never see this one coming he has sex the giantess as a worm uh, as Odin and uh and so three successive nights, um, they, they enjoy uh, the delights of the connubial bed. And then he gets a sip of mead. Is that the end of the story? That's, the, that's basically the end of the story. Wow. That's what I want to think about that. I want, that, I want, that, I want to let the silence sink in. See, what I was going to say something so much more wholesome than Go any on. of this. When you were talking about how Bridget was, was to do with, you know, poetry and also... 
um, Smith. smithing. Yeah. I thought it was fascinating, again, from this period of time, because I'm an old English nerd rather than old Norse. I don't speak old Norse. Um, and one of the uh, characteristics of old English poetry is this idea of entrelacement, which is also... Uh, seen in their smithing. So when you, when you think of Anglo-Saxon designs, all of it's very intricately circular and, and, and there's repeating patterns and everything flows into everything else, which, you know, partly a reflection of how skilled they were and they were showing off and all partly a reflection of how they thought about the world, that their mythology was that everything flowed into everything else and um, and there was kind of impermanence and you just kind of went along with the with the, with the warp and weft of, of, of what happened. Um, and their traditional poetic uh, arrangement follows this too so so you tend to get um four beats in a poetic line two of which um the first two of which have um assonance on consonants so they begin with the same letter or sound um so so when you hear them spoken because of course most of their poetry was spoken um you, you would hear connection and then that will be carried across a gap in the poetic line into another couple of connected words so overall you get this kind of interlinking sense every line and of course and that would be um continue through the whole poem mm -hmm. and how interesting that poetry and, and smithing is something that that has actually yes it is you can actually see it. And, and i think there is actually a famous phrase in beowulf where, the, where a poet is described as something like a like a wordsmith um which doesn't sound particularly exciting because because of course we now all call if we want to be highfalutin people wordsmiths but see, that was how i was going to take this podcast but you went with the the, worm. the the bloody snake sex party well let me make amends by saying uh genuinely until i got to know you and you talked at length and fluently about <gasps> Anglo no this is going good place okay. uh, about Anglo-Saxon poetry uh -huh. obviously I knew that there was a rich tradition of Anglo-Saxon poetry I knew that Beowulf you know is where D&D &D came from so it's, oh it's my good God. and but but I hadn't I'd sort of thought about the um, Anglo-Saxon culture as basically people drinking mead in um, drafty buildings and shouting at each other and hitting each other and I genuinely hadn't realised how sophisticated and it's interlaced really it was and how and yeah you know from a technical point of view when you actually analyze it from a linguistic point of view it's beautiful and they've thought about it and that's clever and of course it's all complicated because the version that we have is written down by christian monks and so they've kind of put on their own stuff and it's all fantastically interesting anyway from a historical perspective and then thematically you also get you know that the, the point of beowulf is not as people might think that there's a bit lots of fights there's actually three fights in beowulf there's beowulf fighting grendel there's beowulf fighting grendel's sexy mum, and then there's grendel uh sorry beowulf fighting a dragon Right, those are the three big sort of moments in Beowulf. But but beyond that, and that you know that is part of it. You're meant to be excited by listening to these epic fights. But beyond that, it's basically a, a, a musing upon um, what happens when a king dies and there's a struggle for inheritance. Mm -hmm. You know, the whole the whole thing is a sort of idea of this encroaching wild outside on this pocket of fragile civilization. Um, and and you know, the, the, it's just it's very it's brilliant and complicated and great. So origin of D D, whatever but then of course you get um they were well into their limericks people don't know this about anglo-saxons i didn't know that no either. i have a book of old english limericks and they are dirty and <laughs> really really silly so one of them is like um oh what what am i i am long and stern i'm often held <laughs> in maids aprons what am i oh and i'm i bulge at the end mm, what am i am i i'm an <laughs> onion and everyone goes ah so that they love that so <laughs> they've got the whole human experience wrapped up in some old parts you you reminded me i was going to talk briefly about the etymology in cavassia <clears throat> and i was reading up on so i i did some prep for this and I brought myself with the Calabasia thing and I realised two things that have both come up recently. One, I've been reading about um, a bunch of Eastern European culture and Russian culture um, for uh, specifically Lithuanian and Russian um, culture uh, for Exile, which is the DLC we're, we're putting out um, next month. And one of the things that is in common across Russia, Lithuania and some other countries in the region is Kvass. Uh, which I hadn't really heard of, but I'm sure a lot of people from that part of the world will, will know, which is a very, 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 very slightly alcoholic drink that is made sort of like the Egyptians used to make beer, as far as I can tell. You put bread in water, you leave it for a while, 
then you strain the gunk out and then you flavour it with berries or something uh, and then apparently you drink it. But kvass is from the same root as kvassia, obviously, and it seems to be this proto-Germanic or um, uh, PIE uh, or, or something root, which uh, means something like squeeze or crush. So this idea of crushing berries mm. or crushing people to get the, the blood out. But also, you remember, Lottie, we were talking about Yiddish the other day and how great a lot of Yiddish words are. We do love Yiddish. And we like kvetch. We do. To mean, you know, to complain or... But what, uh, kvetch comes from the same root. And again, ah. it means squeeze or crush. So apparently you can, like, kvetch out the last drops in a bottle of ketchup as well. So good. And, you know, if you're kvetching, you're kind of squeezing out this. this. Ah, another thing. So kvetch, kvass here, kvass, all the same under the skin. That's great. And it's interesting that you thought of ketchup as your condiment of choice, bearing in mind kvetchup. the theme of this podcast. Do you have anything else horrible you want to say? Yeah, about? well, I was. I, I, Madness, I, I, women, blood. I, I was going to talk about my ads, but we're almost out of time. I think, I think my ads are cool enough to deserve an entire podcast of their own. I, I have to are. say that a lot of this <coughs> stuff, I mean, okay, on the one hand, it is, from a feminist point of view, it is frustrating that so much of literature is making these mad statements about women and, and what's unnatural and what's not. But But I don't want to be, you know, nasty to these people I think it's very important when you read old stuff even if it's old only by 50 years that you recognise that there is different ideas of what's going on and there are different modes so just because somebody said something 100 years ago that we now think we're probably not really on if you heard it at a party does not mean that that suddenly is devoid of, of artistic or, or, or whatever else merit I think I think we can be annoyed at something and still admire it for many different reasons so I hope nobody takes this podcast as you know we shouldn't ever listen to any silly men and Freud even though he's annoying did have a massive impact on lots of things so so just to be clear on that point but I have to say I think so much of this could be avoided if one man <laughs> had just spoken to one woman like I'm reading um, Hilary Mantel's Wolf Hall at the minute which I'm very much enjoying which is set in the reign of Henry as he's married to Anne Boleyn and it all goes complicated um, and there is a rather unattractive nobleman called the Earl of Norfolk in there and literally he he says to, to Thomas Cromwell the hero at one point um, you couldn't have a conversation with a woman I mean <laughs> What would you talk about? And it's a genuine question. I mean, they don't want to talk about horses. They don't want to talk about <laughs> how great other women are. They don't want to talk about drinking beer. I mean, what, what, what else have but, you got? But I think that's the point. I think, I think there is this... Fun that I think for, for centuries, it didn't really occur to anybody, for, for, for a bunch of complicated reasons, that maybe you could ask a lady what menstruation is like. But then you'd have to talk to a lady about menstruation. <laughs> What are you insane? The next thing you know, she'll be spewing menstrual blood all over your mirrors and your ivory. And it'll be cracking and dulling, and the dogs will be drinking it, going mad and biting people. That which happens once a month in this household. I mean, it's embarrassing. That's why we don't have a dog. <laughs> wow. Okay. I'm going to tell so... my favourite story about Freud just before we close, which is nothing to do with anything we'll be discussing apart from the fact that it's Freud. Okay. And it's just that when uh, Freud was in Vienna uh, at the time of the Anschluss, when uh, Germany annexed Austria. Um, the Good Gestapo came out and questioned him because you could imagine a, a, a Jewish intellectual who talks <laughs> about sex was not top of the Gestapo's Christmas card list but he was top of some of their other lists so they came around I think sort of searched his house and, and <laughs> bowls him. of cocaine and then at the end they, they said we'd like to sign this letter saying that, that you know this whole thing was of your own free will we didn't um, uh, coerce you and you let us in and, and, um, and so Freud sat down and read the letter through and he wrote at the end of it um, something along the lines of I very much enjoyed the Gestapo. Would like to recommend the Gestapo to all my friends. And then he signed it and he gave it to them. I think baiting the Gestapo was probably a very fun and very, very <laughs> brave thing to do. Right. Well, I hope you've enjoyed listening to our pretty horrendous podcast, really. Next time it'll be wholesome. We'll talk about kittens. Yeah, but you'll find some horrible story ads. about kittens. Yeah, kittens and mine ads together at last. Um... Well, yeah, that's it from us. Thank you for listening. Uh, play Culture Simulator if you haven't. Experience the true horror of the Red Grail and its well in the centre of the wood. And the Forger Days. And the Forger Days, which isn't quite as horrible. Um, and we'll see you next time. After your spooky day. Mm -hmm.